get started then. So uh, my name is Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And today's Learn and Share conference call is on vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy. And we're very happy to have with us today uh, Dr. Temanushka Mihalova, who's an epileptologist from University of Michigan Health System. And uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Russ. Uh, I uh, really want to thank you for your invitation and for this great opportunity to participate in this conference and share some information about VNS, um, probably with people who need it most. Great, great. And so can you give us a, a brief overview of your clinical and research interests and also your experience with this particular topic? Sure. Um, I uh, did all of my training uh, at the Wayne State University in Detroit, um, and this is where I um, completed neurology residency uh, and then one year of uh, epilepsy fellowship. Um, since uh, I've been working as an adult epileptologist at the University of Michigan, and I exclusively see patients with uh, medically re refractory epilepsy, uh, my special interests are actually in management of uh, drug-resistant epilepsies uh, by using either novel drugs or um, epilepsy surgery or uh, devices. I am uh, board certified in neurology, and I have two boards um, in uh, clinical neurophysiology and uh, in epilepsy in addition. Uh, and I also um, have a PhD in um, epilepsy. Uh, my thesis was on EEG utilities and management of newly diagnosed seizures. Okay, great. So for anyone who's not familiar with uh, vagus nerve stimulation, can you give a quick overview of the, of the VNS device and what it does? And what, we'll talk more about it in more detail later, but just kind of a quick overview. Of course, um, VNS is a unique treatment approach developed specifically for people with medically refractory epilepsy. Um, and uh, all over the world, there are more than 80,000 people who have VNS. VNS is not another medication, and it does not evolve brain surgery. VNS has been proven to reduce the number and intensity of seizures, and in addition, it improves mood, alertness, memory. For some patients with focal seizures or also called uh, partial onset seizures, the adverse effects of anti-epileptic drugs are quite intolerable. For others, no single drug or combination of medications is effective. Brain surgery um, is a great opportunity, alternative to pharma pharmacotherapy, but many patients with focal seizures in particular are not optimal candidates for intracranial surgery. Um, I just want to say a few words about VNS, and I know that we'll talk about that later as well, but um, just in general, VNS therapy is delivered by a device uh, that we call a generator, uh, similar to a pacemaker with a size of a wristwatch that is placed under the skin, usually in the left upper chest area. A thin, flexible wire, we call that lead, connects the generator to the left vagus nerve in the neck and sends pulses to the nerve that transmits them to the brain to help seizure control. Treatment is automatically delivered at regular intervals all day so that the patients do not have to worry about missing a dose. The VNS therapy comes with a handheld magnet that can be used by patients or caregivers to uh, stimulate the generator and send an additional pulse to the vagus nerve and the brain the brain, I'm sorry, by which the magnet actually can stop seizures, can shorten seizures, or can shorten the recovery period after seizures. And the magnet can be used as well uh, to control side effects sometimes. I only want to um, say that um, there is a new VNS uh, a model now um, that's called Aspire uh, SR. Um, it was approved um, um, this past June, and it provides responsive stimulation to heart rate increases that may be associated with seizures. Okay. So, oh, so can you describe that a little, a little more? So, basically, if the heart rate increases as a result yes, of a seizure, uh, it automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay. It it stimulates. Yeah. It actually it works as a regular traditional VNS. 
it will, I'll, I'll tell you about this in a moment. Sure. But uh, in addition to that, it has this uh, the, a feature that it gives additional electric pulse to the vagus nerve uh, whenever the seizure involves uh, increase in heart rate. Okay. And in, in, in fact, it's, it's been um, um, discovered that maybe about 50% of the seizures in, in people can involve some increase in heart rate. So um, potentially that's a, a very uh, beneficial feature of this new model. Okay. And just, maybe we were planning on talking about it later, but just so I don't forget, um, how, how, do you, mm -hmm. how does it distinguish between seizure-related heart rate increases and heart rate increases that might be normal like due to exercise? Right. Sometimes or, could be, yeah, that could be challenging sometimes, but typically what we know from our experience is that the heart rate during seizures increase uh, at least by 50%. Um, so we um, do a pre-surgical um, EEG, I'm sorry, EKG recording, and we um, define so-called heart vector, which is uh, basically um, um, evaluation, assessment of the QRS complexes, which are uh, essential part of the EKG in uh, seven different body positions. And this is how we define the heart vector. And then we set the um, device um, settings in a way that it's going to sense increase in changing this heart vector by 50%. So this is um, when we uh, the device will um, uh, turn on and will stimulate. And this is what typically happens during a seizure activity. Okay. And can that, that part of that new feature be disabled in the device, or is that automatic? Or is yes, that it could be disabled okay. as well if um, it is found um, uncomfortable for some reason. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, so who can possibly benefit from the vagus nerve stimulator in terms of age or epilepsy type? Um, venous therapy would be best indicated for people with medical refractory epilepsy who have seizures despite treatment with two or more drugs and or have side effects that are difficult to tolerate. Uh, in, in the United States, VNS was approved in 1997 for use as an adjunctive therapy or add-on therapy in adults and adolescents over 12 years with focal seizures. In Europe, VNS is indicated as an adult add-on therapy, not just for patients with focal seizures, but also uh, for patients with generalized seizures. And I believe there is no age limitation. Uh, the VNS uh, therapy is also indicated in our country for adjunctive long-term therapy of chronic or recurrent depression for patients 18 years and older who haven't had an adequate response to four or more antidepressants. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously the FDA has its its guidelines, but, but there's off-label use as well. So in, in, in the United Correct. States, it, also, it can also be used for people with generalized epilepsies and people who are yes. less than 12 years old, correct? This is correct, yeah. We, we use it off-label for, for these patient subsets. Okay, great. And are there any subgroups of patients with epilepsy for whom the VNS is particularly a, a particularly good option? Um, indications for VNS therapy were derived from um, clinical trial experience, not from understanding of its physiological action. Okay. So age, gender, seizure frequency, type of seizures, CEG abnormalities cannot predict response to VNS. The type or number of um, uh, medications also do not predict response. Although optimal use parameters continue to be defined, um, candidates should meet the following criteria in general. First of all, medically refractory epilepsy with multiple or bilateral independent seizure foci and multiple seizures both with partial or generalized onset, adequate trials of at least two medications, which basically uh, is what make these people uh, medically refractory, difficulty with medication adherence or intolerable side effects, exclusion of non-epileptic seizures, unsuitability for epilepsy or brain surgery. People, both children and adults, with recurrent bouts of seizures that frequent, frequently escalate to hospitalization often benefit from VNS most. Um, and again, patients with refractory seizures with ictotachycardia, increased heart rate during seizures, will benefit from that novel VNS device that I uh, mentioned about. Right. 
And what may, what would make someone a, a poor candidate for VNS, or when is VNS contraindicated? <clears throat> yeah, so um, VNS therapy is rarely contraindicated, right. uh, which is great, but absolute contraindication is previous bilateral or left uh, cervical vagotomy. In other words, um, any type of surgical procedure or even radiation sometimes can cause scar tissue um, um, to the vagus nerve. Um, safety and efficacy haven't been established for stimulation of the right vagus nerve. Uh, although sometimes we have to use the right vagus nerve if we have that um, contraindication. Um, also, VNS may not be optimal for patients who are on uh, so-called diathermy therapy. This is a medical or surgical technique involving the production of heat in a body part by high electric currents. Uh, damage, and, and this is a, a permanent nerve damage, may occur whether the VNS is turned on or off. I want to say here that diagnostic ultrasound is not contraindicated. It, um, VNS may not be the best option for people who are known to need uh, frequent MRI imaging of uh, body parts other than, other than the head or the extremities. And also, um, some uh, neurologists may be reluctant to recommend VNS for patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, bad asthma, cardiac arrhythmias, or other cardiovascular or pulmonary conditions that cannot be adequately controlled medically. Uh, so cardiologic evaluation should be pre should precede implantation, uh, and, and uh, probably these patients should have uh, post-procedural holder monitoring as well. Okay. Um, so in some cases, people elect to have VNS surgery because they're not a candidate for brain surgery or for responsive neurostimulation or the neuropace. But in other cases, they may be a candidate for all three treatments, but they end up choosing VNS. Can you talk about some of the reasons why patients may opt for VNS over epilepsy brain surgery or, or responsive neurostimulation? Uh, sure. And um, I would like to answer this question by giving um, a brief overview of these different treatment options. Okay. Um, Patients with medically refractory epilepsy who are not candidates for potentially curative brain surgery may benefit from the implantation of a neuromodulation device, either VNS or RNS. These devices require surgical implantation. Um, there are currently no head-to-head -head trials comparing different neuromodulation devices, but the data from the clinical trials on VNS and RNS demonstrate good efficacy that improves over time. The choice of device, therefore, depends on the type of epilepsy, whether the seizure focus can be identified, and other um, clinical factors. In general, uh, neuromodulation devices use electrical stimulation to decrease the excitability of the brain, and thereby uh, they decrease the frequency or duration of seizures. The neuropace, or RNS, acts directly on the brain. In contrast, vagus nerve stimulator acts on cranial nerves with stimulation ascending through brain stem, or this is a brain, deep brain structure, and affecting the excitability of the cortex diffusely. Responsive neurostimulation requires uh, the identification of up to two seizure foci and delivers stimulation only in response to the detection of epileptic activity. It requires in intracranial placement of electrodes, which involves um, complicated surgery, uh, much more complicated than VNS implantation, but it allows for long-term uh, monitoring of uh, electrographic seizures and may be effective even when VNS has not produced an optimal response. Another uh, important distinction among neuromodulation devices is between so-called open-loop and closed-loop systems. The traditional VNS system is open-loop system, which means that it simply provides electrical stimulation to target tissues on a pre-programmed schedule. In contrast, closed-loop system detects seizure activity first and then provides electrical stimulation in response. The RNS is actually the first closed-loop system available. Additionally, uh, the latest model that I already mentioned about the VNS, the Aspire model, 
has this optimal cardiac detection mode, which provides electrical stimulation in response to tachycardia, presumed to be a proxy for seizure activity. So actually that feature of this new model is um, a, a closed loop um, feature. Great advantages of the Wegener stimulation um, is that it does not require identification of the seizure focus and also carries this FDA indication for depression, and many of um, uh, our patients who have medically refractory seizures suffer from severe depression as well. Um, um, brain surgery, on the other hand, um, is an invasive procedure. Uh, it is true that uh, it may be curative for many people with epilepsy, but not everybody turns out a good surgical candidate. Um, the pre-surgical evaluation and the surgery um, should take place in a comprehensive epilepsy center. This uh, pre-surgical evaluation involves um, quite sophisticated studies, um, in many cases additional intracranial EEG monitoring and functional testing. Um, um, so overall, uh, due to its less invasive nature and uh, already well-established efficacy and tolerability, um, some patients may find VNS preferable to intracranial devices such as RNS or resective brain surgery. Um, that, that's my uh, opinion. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so let's um, talk a little in, in more detail about the process of getting a VNS. Um, first, what type of pre-surgical evaluation is required? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, patients uh, typically require uh, a referral from their neurologist to an epileptologist at a comprehensive epilepsy center for assessment of suitability. The patient's seizure history, prior and current treatments, um, behavior, past medical problems need to be reviewed very carefully. Alternative treatments are also discussed. Uh, families are fully informed about VNS before embarking on this form of treatment. Um, the epileptologist um, discusses realistic expectations of VNS, how VNS works, the surgical procedure, post-operative care, advantages, disadvantages, continuing medications, the admission process, and so on. So families will meet with the neurosurgeon prior to um, the planned surgery, and this will happen during an outpatient uh, office visit. Um, since the surgery is done under general anesthesia, sometimes patients, depending upon their medical history, of course, will need uh, to meet an anesthesiologist, but often, um, at least at our institution, we typically do that on the day of the surgery. Okay. And now, now can you walk us through the different steps of the surgery itself? Um, uh, sure. Uh, so uh, VNS um, therapy involves a minimally invasive procedure, which typically is performed by a neurosurgeon uh, under general anesthesia. This is a very short procedure, outpatient procedure, in fact, that takes um, uh, on average an hour to a couple hours, and most people go home um, on that same day. Uh, two small incisions are made. Uh, one in a natural crease on the left side of the neck and one on the left upper chest area below the collarbone. A small generator, as I already said, about the size of a pocket watch is placed under the skin in the chest area. A thin flexible wire connects that generator to the left vagus nerve under the skin in the neck. The device is placed on the left since the right vagus nerve plays an important role in uh, cardiac function and stimulating it could have negative cardiac effects. Okay. During surgery, I'm sorry, um, during surgery we perform a, a diagnostic check of the integrity of the VNS system by delivering electric stimulation to the nerve, which very rarely, in fact, I never seen it, by the way, and I do it very often, uh, can cause bradycardia in some patients, especially in those with underlying cardiac conditions. The two wound sites are covered with a clear waterproof dressing, which allows for normal bathing and easy assessment of the wounds. No stitch removal is required, as all stitches dissolve under the skin. Um, I want to say here that antiepileptic medications remain unchanged until sustained response to VNS therapy is documented, and which may take a long time, of course. 
neurosurgical follow-up occurs shortly after the discharge, uh, and um, this is when the neurosurgeon will also assess the wound sites. So the device does not work immediately. That's uh, another important information. It remains off for two weeks to provide enough time for healing, and then the stimulation is turned on. So the first post-operative office visit is typically in two weeks. The dose settings will be adjusted slowly by the neurologist during just routine outpatient office visits, and, and, and they'll be typically scheduled about every two or four weeks. During programming, the magnet settings um, uh, will be adjusted accordingly. Uh, and uh, studies show that the benefits of VNS continue to improve over time, uh, so the VNS therapy should be given some time to work, and it may take anywhere from a few months to two years to see the full benefit of VNS. Um, and I want to uh, say also that VNS may be continued indefinitely and without damage to the vagus nerve as long as the stimulation uh, is less than uh, certain um, parameter limits um, um, and as long as the on time remains longer than um, the off time okay. of the stimulation. And what are the most common post-surgical symptoms, uh, temporary problems, and, and then how long do they typically last? Uh, yes, so I already said that um, uh, the VNS implantation involves a minimally in invasive uh, procedure, but even minimal invasive uh, procedures are associated with um, some surgery-related risks, such as a risk of infection at the site of the operation or bleeding. These occur uh, rarely and are temporary. Fluid accumulation at the generator site with or without infection occurs in um, about one to two of implantations and results with aspiration and antibiotics. Um, there are rare cases, of course, of refractory infections, uh, and um, uh, in these cases, we will need to remove the generator. Excessive manipulation of the nerve during surgery can cause uh, local ischemia to the nerve, uh, which can lead to vocal cord paralysis, which may result in swallowing difficulties and uh, hoarseness. Um, this is uh, also quite rare and typically resolves over several weeks to a month. Okay. And uh, you, you talked a little bit about the settings on the VNS mm -hmm. and how that's manipulated, but can you talk a little bit more about how uh, the settings are determined and how they're adjusted over time? Um, of course. Um, the device settings are programmed by the patient's neurologist during, like I said, outpatient, routine outpatient office visits. Uh, the neurologist uses a portable programmer, which is basically a very small computer, connected to a handheld wand that will be placed over the generator. The uh, programming takes about five, ten minutes and involves changes in several parameters that I want to mention, output current, pulse duration, frequency of stimulation, on and off time of stimulation, and magnet current. By programming the device, any of these parameters can be varied. In the initial trials, for example, the vagus nerve was stimulated for 30 seconds every five minutes, and this is, in fact, the most common setting that we're still using in, in our practice. During each 30-second stimulation, the device delivers 500 microsecond pulses at 30 hertz frequency. For each individual, the intensity of the current is set at the highest that is tolerable. The settings are typically altered every few weeks, and the output current is increased in a stepwise fashion by 0.25 milliamps until it reaches about 2 or 2.25 milliamps if tolerated, of course. If by then there is no reduction in seizure frequency, no benefits whatsoever, most of the neurologists uh, will increase the time on or will try some other um, um, adjustment of other parameters. In case of side effects, and um, I, I can talk about that later, but typically voice changes, cough pain, um, these can be ameliorated by adjustment of the device parameters. During programming the magnet, uh, current is always adjusted accordingly to the device parameters, and it is set at a slightly higher intensity and a longer time on. Okay. And so uh, 
what is the, what's the battery life of the current model, the Aspire SR, mm-hmm. and the and the you know I guess the previous model, um, and how extensive is the process of replacing the battery? And then when you do, when the battery does run out, do you typically re- replace just the battery, or do you upgrade the whole unit to mm-hmm. the next model? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, the typical battery life is five to eight years for older models that we're not using anymore. Uh, the battery life is shortest. For the newest models, including this um, Aspire um, model, the battery life is up to 10 years. Uh, But um, the battery life is highly dependent on the device settings or duty cycles, um, as well as on the frequency and duration of magnet use. So uh, we typically replace just the battery. um, and, and this is typically um, done during a very short um, inpatient procedure, but very short, less than an hour. Okay. And are there any other components that deteriorate and eventually need to be replaced? Um, so, as I said, typically the generator due to battery depletion, but in case of lead malfunction, uh, the lead has to be replaced as well. Uh, most of the time, uh, lead malfunction is easily identified by the patients who either stop feeling the stimulations or start feeling them irregularly or they feel painful stimulation. Or this could be discovered during a diagnostic testing uh, that we do um, uh, during routine office visits. Um, there have been also rare cases of um, lead fractures resulting from excessive manual manipulation of the generator or the wire in the neck, and in such cases, the lead has to be replaced as well. Okay. And the the part that actually wraps around the vagus nerve, is that uh, can that be removed, or is that too risky to even try to remove that? If that has so, a uh, yeah. It? Yeah, if we have to remove the lead, sometimes that may be actually challenging because um, um, over time there is development of scar tissue, uh, and uh, in, in this, the vagus nerve is very important. Uh, it has a uh, very um, um, significant respiratory cardiac GI uh, function, so it may be really tricky to manipulate uh, the nerve uh, uh, during the removal of the lead. So sometimes, actually, it may be impossible to uh, remove the lead. Okay. And what are the advantages of having your VNS implanted at a comprehensive epilepsy center as opposed to um, not, basically? Mm-hmm. Well, I think a lot. <laughs> um, so, a meticulous planning, first of all, is mandatory before implantation of VNS, um, and this is this is something that can be done in in a, a comprehensive epilepsy center. Many questions need to be answered before implantation. It's not that easy. We have to really uh, know very well uh, patient's history, first of all, to make sure that people have uh, the diagnosis of epilepsy, the correct diagnosis. Uh, that their, their seizures are refractory to pharmacological treatment and um, to make the decision that the VNS would be the best choice of so many other available uh, choices now. Um, in addition, a plan for management before, during, and after surgery has to be in place. So this requires a thorough workup involving multidisciplinary team of medical providers with expertise in diagnosis and management of um, epilepsy, uh, epileptologists, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, uh, neuropsychologists, um, uh, speech pathologists, etc. Um, also, seizure monitoring with uh, video EEG should be a minimum requirement for most, if not for all patients receiving VNS. And, and it, it is an essential part of the diagnostic process um, that's, in fact, standard of care in a comprehensive epilepsy unit. Um, and in addition, uh, often not only medical but psychosocial considerations have to be taken into account uh, before the decision is made for VNS implantation. Okay, great. Um, so an important feature of the VNS that we've mentioned is the magnet. Uh, Can you explain a little more about what the magnet looks like, how it works, and the different ways that it can be used? Sure. Um, The magnet is included and is given to everybody who receives VNS therapy. It looks like a wristwatch and can be worn on the wrist typically or on the belt or in any other way actually convenient for uh, patients and caregivers. 
the magnet delivers on-demand stimulation and can be used by um, either patients or their caregivers to stimulate the generator and send an additional pulse to the vagus nerve and the brain uh, by which the magnet actually uh, can stop seizures, can shorten seizures, um, can decrease the seizure severity or reduce the recovery period. Um, this is done uh, by a brief swiping of the mag magnet over the generator in the chest, and the contact time shouldn't be any longer than two to three seconds. The um, handheld magnet can be uh, also used to control side effects uh, that sometimes um, occur, especially during uh, specific um, activities, um, um, such as uh, public speaking, singing, etc. Okay, and that and do uh, to keep the device turned off, you basically tape tape or hold the magnet over over the, de That's the device. That's correct. Okay. Yes, this is how we control the side effects um, when necessary. We uh, typically tape the magnet uh, over the generator, um, and which will automatically uh, turn off the generator once the activity is over then the magnet can be taken away and the generator will um, turn back on. Okay. Um, and and it, let's say someone lost their magnet and wanted to try and use a different type of magnet, would that be yes, actually, not any, advisable any or, or would, would other magnets work? <laughs> So, yeah, if uh, we typically uh, provide our patients with uh, one additional magnet, so all of them have two magnets, but if it happens that they lose both of them, <laughs> uh, um, we will be happy, and I'm sure that um, um, other centers do the same thing, uh, we'll be happy to provide uh, the patients for additional magnets for free. And uh, meanwhile, uh, patients can use just any magnet, in fact, to stimulate the device, the okay. generator, if needed. Okay. Um, so a lot of people find the magnet to be helpful, but ha has there been any specific research on magnet use and its impact, like how, you know how often it's mm -hmm. used or it should be used, how often it stops uh, maybe a simple partial seizure mm -hmm. from generalizing or uh, any negative effects of, of frequent magnet use? Right. Um, yes, there has been some research, although it is not as much as the research uh, focusing on the device itself. Right. And uh, in order to answer your question, I would like to just simply cite the um, data from some clinical trials, which is, um, in fact, quite similar to what I hear from my patients with VNS. Um, so, for example, um, there was a recent review of 20 studies comprising over 800 patients with VNS both uh, uh, with both partial and generalized seizures, uh, reported on-demand magnet stimulation to be beneficial. A benefit was reported uh, in an average of about 45% of patients using the magnet, with seizure cessation claimed in about 30% of these uh, people. In addition to seizure termination, uh, patients report uh, decreased intensity or duration of seizures or the post-ictal period, the post-seizure period. In some of the studies, um, the seizure cessation was confirmed by EEG, so it's really not just an, uh, a subjective perception. Um, having that said, not, no controlled studies um, um, uh, have prospectively evaluated the isolated effect of magnet mode stimulation at the time of the seizure onset. In addition, uh, data from animal studies show reduction in seizure frequency, seizure duration, and recovery period with magnet use. Uh, estimates of how often the magnet is used by people receiving VNS therapy were made uh, using a 1998 Cyberonics registry of uh, over 2,500 enrolled patients. So overall, about 60% um, used the magnet at least once. Some benefit was reported by about 85%, which is very impressive, of users. The magnet was applied by the patient in only 40% of instances and by caregivers for the remainder of occasions. The Cyberonics post-marketing surveillance procedure implemented in 2007, documented an average of approximately one activation per patient per day. And in, in general, it is recommended that patients activate the device uh, via the magnet once a day to make sure that it's still working. 
too frequent and prolonged use of the magnet, which means multiple times uh, every day over a prolonged period of time, several hours in a row, may lead to faster battery depletion, though. Um, so um, I could not um, you know, find any um, serious side effects reported in the literature that were associated with magnet uh, mode stimulation. Non-serious side effects um, associated with the magnet um, include typically painful or uncomfortable stimulation, sometimes um, a headache, a hoarseness, shortness of breath, um, and cough. So what are the guidelines for magnet storage um, so it doesn't damage other things like credit cards or TVs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can damage credit cards. So it it, it should be um, actually stored away, um, um, at least uh, one foot away from um, items and equipment. So for example, credit cards, as you mentioned, even cell phones, computer disks, televisions, um, and in general, um, all items that could be affected by a strong magnetic field. Okay. And what are some precautions that patients with VNS need to take in terms of MRIs, metal detectors, and other environmental exposures or medical procedures? Um, generally, household appliances such as microwave, ovens, toasters, hair dryers, cell phones will not affect the device. Magnet contained in some tablet computers and covers, such as Apple iPad products, for example, may be strong enough to cause accidental activation of a VNS stimulation. Patients should be cautious and, in general, should avoid devices that generate a strong electric or magnetic field and stay, like I said, at least a foot away. Uh, metal detectors and anti-theft devices should not affect the VNS um, or be affected by it. However, um, I advise my patients to move through a metal detector as fast as possible and at a steady pace. Another helpful tip is to always avoid areas where pacemaker warning signs are posted. In terms of medical procedures, uh, VNS therapy is compatible with tests such as x-ray, CAT scan, or diagnostic ultrasound. In terms of MRI, VNS is compatible only under speci special circumstances that require adherences to specific protocols. For the manufacturer, only MRI of the head and MRI of the extremities can be done with the use of a specific head or local coil, so-called so transmit-receive coil. Otherwise, the heat induced in the lead will cause uh, permanent nerve damage. Intact lead without implanted generator can still cause local injury. So, therefore, sometimes that may be uh, one of the reasons why the lead has to be removed as well. In general, MRI of any body part should be done only after careful review of the manufacturer guidelines. Overall, um, um, I, we do not perform MRI in the following situations. Um, generator explanted, but part of the lead remains in place, uh, or presence of lead break, or patients have other implanted devices in addition to the VMS. It is assumed that uh, therapeutic radiation may damage the generator, although no testing has been done to date and no um, definite information is available. Um, also, uh, use of uh, electrosurgery um, or radioablation devices may damage the generator. Okay. And if, if someone is scheduled to have an MRI for, and they have a VNS, mm -hmm. is simply letting the, the health system or the provider know that they have a VNS enough to get to, to make to ensure that they follow the proper protocols, or or does a patient have mm -hmm. to be really their own self advocate and really make sure that they're aware of the proper protocols? So both actually, uh, um, the patient should be uh, well aware that they have to um, notify about the VNS uh, presence, and then um, the doctors um, should be aware as well. Um, and typically, um, the neurologist. Um, uh, will turn off the device before the procedure and the device will remain turned off during the entire procedure and after the MRI is done, we will turn it back on. So um, um, this is very important. Okay. So again, we've, we've 
touched on some of these already, but what are what would you say are the most common side effects of the mm-hmm. VNS? Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, most common side effects of the VNS are dose dependent. Um, in other words, are more frequently reported in patients who have high um, stimulation. Um, and, but um, even though um, they're not that severe, um, and they they can be modified um, uh, with adjustment of uh, VNS parameters, many patients become accustomed to um, these side effects with time. Um, most uh, patients experience voice alteration, hoarseness, and cough, uh, followed by neck discomfort or pain, sometimes shortness of breath, tingling sensation in the left neck on delivery of the electric pulse. Uh, very rarely um, nausea, headache, uh, hiccups are reported. And um, again, these are mostly seen in people who have high intensity stimulation compared to people receiving low stimulation. Uh, patients with obstructive sleep apnea may have an increase in uh, apneic events during stimulation, which also can be avoided by setting adjustment. Um, um, despite the widespread system effects of the vagus nerve on uh, lungs, heart, uh, GI tracts, um, systemic side effects are rarely reported. No substantial effects on cardiac function um, were reported during clinical trials. No clinically relevant effects on the GI system, vital signs, or weight are reported, although I personally have some patients who tell me that they, they have lost some weight, actually, um, uh, since um, being implanted. Um, children and adults with history of dysphagia may experience swallowing difficulties during VNS therapy, which is also amenable to setting modification. Okay. And are the, for for the most <coughs> excuse me for the most common side mm-hmm. effects? Are, do you have any particular tips or strategies for managing these side effects? Obviously, you mentioned changing the settings, sure, but are, yep. are there other things that can be done? Right, right. Um, yeah, uh, I mentioned about um, low intensity stimulation. First of all, if of course this is acceptable uh, for patient seizure control, um, typically low intensity stimulation produces. Uh, um, less and uh, tolerable side effects, appropriate adjustment of the VNS settings, as you said. Um, The magnet can be used to ameliorate side effects, and I I already said a few words about that. So typically, again, I would like to repeat, so the magnet is either held or taped over the generator for a prolonged time, um, and then the stimulation will stop temporarily, which is very beneficial in certain situations, um, like people who have to give a public uh, talk or singing, during singing, during um, vigorous exercising, et cetera. Okay. And, um, again, we we mentioned some uh, possible complications after surgery, temporary ones. Are there other complications or serious side effects that are possible, and and Mm -hmm. how common are they? Mm -hmm. Well, um, acute side effects are the side effects that occur within uh, the first um, few weeks um, after um, we turn on the generator. Uh, And they occur about in about 3 to 6% of patients. Um, And um, uh, they may include some uh, lower facial pulses, sometimes bleeding and site infection. The most common long-term side effects include, um, as I already said, alteration in voice, cough, throat pain, hoarseness, and um, they have been reported in up to 40% of patients, and they typically improve over time. Um, Serious side effects, such as asystole, uh, bradycardia, um, have been reported, but their incidence is very, very low, um, somewhere around 0.1%. Vocal cord paralysis um, uh, is another um, sort of serious uh, complication, but also occurs very rarely in about 1%. Um, and typically resolves uh, within several weeks. Okay. Uh, so if the VNS is really not well tolerated, and there's a lot of a lot of side effects or serious complications, mm-hmm. um, and adjusting the settings doesn't help, can it be removed? Mm, yes, of course. And there are several options. Um, the device, first of all, can be only turned off and it remains implanted for an indefinite period of time. But it can be also removed if recommended. Uh, removal of the generator 
um, involves, I mentioned about that, a minor procedure, and we typically leave the lead behind uh, as this involves more complicated procedure. Uh, the um, surgical time is about less than an hour, actually, but at the most an hour, um, and this procedure is also done under general anesthesia. If the lead needs to be removed, um, um, that could be challenging, but overall, um, um, it, it takes the same amount of preparation and, and surgical uh, time as the generator removal. Um, and um, it is very important, actually, to uh, relay the message that people with VNS can still be candidates for medical trials with new medications or, or for other procedures that could emerge in the future. Okay. So, yeah, along those lines, can can someone who has a VNS and an active VNS still have resective brain surgery or or the neuropace or responsive neurostimulation at mm -hmm. a later time? Oh, yeah. If so, is the pulse generator typically removed, turned off, or kept on, or mm -hmm. how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So uh, patients who have VNS can definitely have uh, brain surgery or can have RNS implanted later on. And the post generator um, can be um, kept in place um, or removed. We typically keep it in place uh, if there is no really any other strong indication to take it out. And if, it kept, uh, if it's kept in place, it could be either turned on or turned off. Okay. So that's not a, a problem. It's not a, um, a, anything that would preclude our patients from uh, getting additional treatment. Okay. So um, <clears throat> patients with the VNS typically continue to take their anti-seizure medications afterwards, but uh, how mm -hmm. often are they able to at least reduce the dosage or the number of medications they're taking? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, typically patients continue to take their medications, uh, but uh, even before maximal benefit of VNS is achieved, which is usually up to two years after implantation, many patients are able to reduce their doses or the number of medications. And I just want to give an uh, um, example from literature. So um, in a study, it's a small size study, uh, but uh, uh, 21 patients were involved and they had VNS uh, for the diagnosis of refractory epilepsy. Um, that uh, um, group of uh, patients were um, actually compared to a case match control group um, who were on anti-epileptic um, uh, medications. And it was found that uh, a significant anti-epileptic drug reduction occurred in about 40% of the patients with VNS, with dose reduction in about 20%. For um, the patients who did not reduce their uh, medication number, um, dose reduction uh, occurred in about 30%. So yes, um, that's the answer. Drug and dose reduction is uh, possible, um, and it, it, this is not something that's going to lead to loss of seizure control um, or a loss of uh, patient satisfaction. Okay. So uh, what has the research shown in terms of seizure-related outcomes for VNS? Uh, things like average reduction in seizures, the responder rate, how many people become seizure-free, how what the improvement over time looks like. Um. Right. Um, well, the first um, randomized control trial was undertaken by the Vagus Nerve Stimulation Study Group and published in 1995. Um, this trial was conducted in 17 centers across North America and Europe and recruited uh, over 100 patients with uh, uh, intractable seizures in a wide range of seizure types who were taking on average two medications. This study compared the efficacy of VNS at high levels versus low stimulation intensity. Uh, and patients were blinded to their stimulation settings as was the investigator responsible for data collection. Uh, in the group receiving high intensity VNS, so-called uh, therapeutic dose, seizure frequency was reduced by 25% at three months. In the group receiving low intensity, uh, presumably subtherapeutic dose, VNS, seizure frequency was reduced only by 6%. So then um, there was a second randomized control trial 
And this was carried out and published in, I believe, 1998, looking specifically at the use of VNS um, in the management of focal seizures, partial onset seizures. Um, a good number of patients, close to 200 patients, were randomized to receive either high or low level of stimulation, and they were followed up for uh, at least three months. And in the group receiving high-level VNS, the responder rate was about 23%. And responder rate means people who have uh, 50 or more percent, 50 percent or more seizure reduction. At one year post implantation, the responder rate increased to 35%. The results of a uh, follow up study of over 400 patients from five clinical trials, including these two um, control trials, randomized control trials that I just um, talked about. Uh, um, were published later on, and the responder rate, so again, 50% uh, or more reduction in seizure frequency, was 37% at one year, 43% at two years, and 43% at three years. So also um, a small group of patients had um, more significant seizure reduction, about 75%. And only a very small group, like about 3 to 5% um, of patients were seizure-free. So really, VNS is not curative, but definitely can palliate seizures. Another um, large retrospective study um, with over 430 patients demonstrated mean seizure reduction of 55% in nearly five years of follow-up, which is very encouraging. So over time, definitely, we can see increase in the uh, benefit of the VNS. Um, um, so um, other studies uh, compared the effectiveness of VNS for different seizure types uh, with mixed results. A recent multi-center trial in Israel, for example, found that VNS was most effective in partial seizures, where the responder rate was 50%. A previous study reported high responder rates in uh, generalized epilepsy, about 60% of patients compared to partial epilepsy. Uh, so now uh, we have data showing improved seizure control over 10 years after implantation. Um, and although this data comes from a small patient um, um, size, about 65 uh, patients um, who received VNS over 10 years, um, the responder rate was 86% and a mean decrease in seizure frequency of 76%. So this is very, very um, reassuring. Um, because I've been talking only about adults, but I, um, since I'm an adult epileptologist, I would like to say a few words about the children and their uh, and the outcomes after VNS implantation. Um, so overall, um, in terms of results in children, about 30 to 50 percent of children will gain a significant improvement in seizure control with reduced seizure frequency or severity. And uh, less than 10%, which is similar to what we see in adults, will become seizure-free. Most of the children will continue taking anti-epileptic medications. Um, and these results are similar across uh, all seizure types and syndromes, um, although there is some suggestion that children who have uh, a severe epilepsy syndrome, such as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, may respond better. Um, Termination of prolonged seizures or seizure clusters, in other words, seizures that tend to occur back to back, uh, is quite possible. Um, and this is with VNS uh, uh, therapy, and this is very similar to what we see in adults. Uh, but there is really no way to predict response to VNS in both children and adults. Um, and also in children, uh, VNS um, is shown to improve mood, alertness, overall, overall uh, quality of life. Okay. And how do the seizure-related outcomes for VNS compare to those of resective brain surgery and responsive neurostimulation? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we already discussed seizure-related outcomes for VNS, so I, um, I now I would like to just talk uh, about the seizure-related outcomes for um, RNS and brain surgery. So uh, uh, first of all, I want to say that there are no really head-to-head -head trials, again, comparing VNS and RNS and brain surgery. But uh, um, RNS is a new method of implantable neurostimulation used to treat refractory epilepsy. And RNS can detect seizure activity in the brain by monitoring electrocortical uh, graphic activity 
and by delivering electrical stimulation directly to the seizure foci in order to suppress seizure activity in a targeted way. Uh, implantation involves insertion of electrodes in the target area of the brain, which requires seizure foci identification. The electrodes are connected to a small device generator positioned in the skull. Um, for example, the results of a large randomized control uh, trial exploring RNS is a novel treatment strategy for drug-resistant seizures were published in 2011. Um, RNS uh, uh, was implanted in uh, 190 patients with refractory uh, partial epilepsy, and half of them actually had um, temporal lobe epilepsy, and about 30% had VNS in place of these patients. So. After one month, the patients were randomized to receive either stimulation in response to seizure activity, that was the treatment group, or no stimulation, so this was the control group. Um, and uh, these patients um, had an average of one seizure a day. So seizure frequency uh, was reduced by 34% at one month, 39% at two months, and 41% at three months. So again, we see that improved seizure um, I'm sorry, improved efficacy of the device over time, which is something that we see with VNS. Total seizure reduction for the entire treatment period was close to 40% in the treatment group, um, and this was much higher um, compared to uh, the seizure uh, reduction in the control group. So the others uh, also found that uh, treatment with RNS was associated with improvement in quality of life, Adverse effects reported um, included um, pain at the site of the implantation, headache, um, even some patients reported seizure worsening and some memory impairment. Um, and the majority of the adverse effects were actually self-limiting and, and uh, considered mild. The outcomes, on the other hand, of resective brain surgery can vary and they depend upon patient specifics and type of epilepsy. In general, um, it is, uh, brain surgery is considered um, um, curative for many patients, um, whereas I already said that VNS is rarely curative. Uh, for example, patients with uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, and in particular uh, mesiotemporal lobe epilepsy or lesional temporal lobe epilepsy, benefit the most of brain surgery. And um, um, in this patient group, seizure freedom can be reached um, in about 75 to 85%. Uh, the outcomes are much different for patients who have non-lesional temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, they achieve seizure freedom somewhere about 50 to 60%. And their outcomes are actually lower for extratemporal lobe epilepsy. So seizure freedom is achieved in about roughly about 40%. Um, and then, of course, there are so many other factors that play important role for uh, right. prognostication mm -hmm. of post-surgical outcome, which would be beyond uh, the topic of our discussion. Sure. Sure. Okay. So what, what other um, a aspects of health may be positively impacted by VNS? You, you mentioned mood, cognitive function, maybe overall quality of life, um, is, mm -hmm. and, and is there... Uh, pretty good evidence in the literature for that, or is it largely anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence that suggests that? Uh, I would say both. Yeah, there is some evidence in the literature, but also there there is a lot of anecdotal reports. Um, definitely uh, a particular interest is focused on mood improvement uh, by VNS in epilepsy patients. And um, the studies uh, that are mainly investigating actually the reduction in seizures also comment on um, um, changes in cognition and um, overall uh, quality of life. And uh, these studies demonstrated significant positive mood effects, uh, which, um, which was actually independent of the effects on seizure activity. Um, depressive symptoms, for example, reduced um, in many of the uh, patients who also responded uh, well in terms of seizure frequency. Um, uh, positive mood changes were um, shown in 75% according to one of the studies. And in this, 75% of the patients, in fact, did not respond to VNS in seizure frequency. So in other words, this positive effect on mood was um, not dependent on um, seizure control. 
Um, so the mechanisms of action in mood by VNS are not well understood. Um, uh, and um, I, I'm sure that further research uh, is necessary. Um, also, I want to mention that uh, patients were um, evaluated with so-called quality of life in epilepsy uh, tools uh, and demonstrated significant improvement, particularly in energy level, um, memory, uh, in many social aspects, uh, mental effects, and decreased, uh, decreased fear of seizures. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, another important feature is that um, cost reduction um, um, is um, one of the essential issues actually for patients with medically refractory epilepsy uh, since these people consume a large amount of medical resources. So several studies actually revealed uh, positive cost-benefit influence on healthcare utilization such as outpatient visits, emergency room visits, length of hospital stay, number of hospital admissions. So for example, before VNS, um, the mean yearly epilepsy-related direct medical cost per patient was uh, over $8,500 um, in our country. And the average number of hospital stay per year was 21 days. At 12 months after implantation, the cost decreased to $4,000 and the hospital stay to eight days. So, uh, um, and it, it's really not well understood how VNS works. Um, cognition, for example, and this improved quality of life. Um, and um, there are studies um, that compare VNS with specifically pharmacological treatment, not just with individual drugs, but in general, um, anti-seizure medications. And in these studies also found significant improvement in quality of life compared with pharmacological treatment alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we mentioned that the mechanism for why it improves mood or cognitive function is not well understood. Mm -hmm. Is this the case for why it improves seizures as well? Do we do we have or and are there theories as to why or yeah. why or how yeah. the, how the VNS works? Sure. Yeah, you you're very correct. So, yeah, the mechanisms of action of VNS is not fully understood, but can be reasonably assumed to involve uh brainstem nuclei. Uh, the so-called nucleus of the uh, solitary tract, the main terminus for vagus um, input, has direct or indirect projections to other brainstem nuclei. So these nuclei uh, have been shown to influence cerebral seizure susceptibility. Hence, vagal modulation of one or more of these nuclei could possibly represent the mechanism for seizure suppression. In this context, the immunomodulatory function of the vagus nerve is of particular interest. The input from the vagus nerve can activate so-called cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway upon inflammation. Uh, through this pathway, vagus nerve fibers inhibit the release of pro-inflammatory substances and reduce inflammation. And this is important because in recent years, inflammation has been strongly implicated in the development of seizures and epilepsy, especially refractory epilepsy. And therefore, the activation of the anti-inflammatory pathway by VNS could decrease the inflammatory response and, and thereby can explain um, clinical effects. Another proposed mechanism by which VNS um, reduces seizure activity is that VNS works by increasing cerebral blood flow and activating neuronal networks in um, the brain structures. Okay. Um, so another uh, a newer um, therapy that is being investigated is trigeminal nerve stimulation, which is very similar to the VNS. Um, mm -hmm. Can you briefly describe what that involves, how it differs from VNS, and, and what we know so far about its safety and tolerability and effectiveness? Sure. Um, the trigeminal nerve stimulation system um, is not yet FDA approved, but it is available in Europe and other countries. Um, um, TNS is approved for children nine years and older in Europe. The mechanism of action is unclear. Uh, animal studies suggest that the trigeminal nucleus and its projections to the brain stem nuclei, um, uh, which are in fact the same, some of them at least the same uh, nuclei to which vagus nerve projects, are involved in seizure modulation. 
It also appears to have antidepressant effects uh, in addition to anti-epileptic benefits, and it has the same indications as VNS. So it's indicated for medically refractory epilepsy and severe depression. However, um, the most compelling feature of uh, uh, trigeminal nerve stimulators is that um, uh, um, they are not implanted, but rather applied to the skin with transdermal electrodes, typically at night. The device is worn externally for at least um, 12 hours per day and uses transdermal electrodes to stimulate the supraorbital branches of this trigeminal nerve. And the stimulation parameters are slightly different from the uh, VNS parameters. So I just want to very briefly mention about two separate clinical trials that uh, um, evaluated TNS as a treatment for epilepsy, and they demonstrated uh, uh, positive results. So um, the first trial in 2009 um, uh, involved only 12 subjects with severe epilepsy. Um, uh, the subjects used TNS nightly for 12 weeks and were able to reduce their seizure frequency by an average of 66%. In 2013, results from a double-blind trial conducted in 42 uh, patients demonstrated that after 18 weeks of TNS, 40% of them were able to decrease their seizure frequency by 50% or more. Importantly, patients in the treatment group um, also uh, demonstrated significant improvements in mood, and, and this was independent of the anti-seizure effect. And I, just a couple words about the most common side effects reported with um, trigeminal nerve stimulation, skin irritation, um, tingling, sometimes a bit of a headache or pressure in the head, and rarely anxiety. Really no serious side effects have been reported. Um, for example, no effect on, on heart rate, something that rarely could be seen with VNS. Okay. And is it, do you anticipate that this will be approved by the FDA? Um, and do you have any idea roughly how <laughs> when that would happen? It's, you know, it's always <laughs> right. a, a lot of guesswork with the FDA, but... <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's correct. Well, I think it makes sense that it's 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 going to be improved, uh, approved. I'm sorry soon, and I um, I really don't have a way to predict, but sure. maybe um, in a few years. Okay. And um, in fact, there is a large multi-center pivotal phase three trial uh, for people with uh, um, uh, resist drug-resistant epilepsy um, that's underway. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcomes of this trial because I believe that this would be something to determine how soon uh, the trigeminal nerve stimulation uh, will be approved. Okay, and, and the advantages over, or possible advantages over VNS is that it's not, there's no implantation or surgery. And no surgery, also, and yeah, and also externally it's worn. That's typically just worn at night or in the evening hours. Yes. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, or at any time convenient for patients right. as well. Right. Okay, did you have any, before we open up for questions, did you have any closing thoughts or last points you wanted to make about VNS? Uh, uh, maybe I just want to uh, simply summarize um, in a few sentences what we sure. talked about. Um, uh, VNS is safe and well tolerated long term therapy in adults and children. With uh, drug resistant epilepsy, I was I hope that I was able to convince uh, our audience. Um, I, uh, it can uh, both prevent and abort seizures. Its efficacy is well established. It decreases seizure frequency, seizure duration, and intensity, and shortens recovery period. But its full benefits are typically seen over time, up to two years after implantation. Essential part of the VNS therapy is the magnet that can be used by patients and caregivers to deliver um, on-demand stimulation whenever it is needed. This empowers the patients and the providers a sense of control over epilepsy, which is very important. In addition, the VNS therapy improves mood and quality of life independent of seizure control. And VNS does not have cognitive and systemic side effects that many patients encounter with medications and often uh, patients are able to reduce their medication number or doses. All right, we make a very good case. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and open it up for, for uh, questions. Okay, so before we, before we uh, have any questions, does anyone 
on the line who currently has a VNS want to sh briefly share their experiences with it and, and, and maybe why you chose to get one? Sure, my name is Kathy. I have one. Okay. Um, I was told that um, I could have surgery and able to um, remove or help uh, control the seizures, but I was scared and I didn't want to do the surgery, so I have a, had the VNS implanted in me, um, and I feel that it works really well. Just this past month, I had the battery replaced in the one I have, and um, it seems like everything's going good with it. Great. Great. Thanks. And, and uh, that's an interesting point, uh, Dr. Mihailova. Do you find that um, mm -hmm. that happens fairly often, that, that patients may be a candidate for, for resective surgery, mm -hmm. but they're their fear of surgery or, uh, you know, it, it is brain surgery after all, and, and people may mm -hmm. have fears about that, and, and as a result, they opt instead for what they see as a, a less invasive option. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I believe we talked about that already, but um, I, I wouldn't say very often, but okay. definitely it happens, and I personally have at least maybe two or three patients who um, who are very nervous about having brain surgery and, and they prefer to have a VNS first in place and then, then decide, depending upon the outcomes, whether they will proceed with surgery. So, so far they have been doing okay and um, um, I, I really expect that this will be a sustained um, good response. Okay. Um, any other, yeah. Anyone else want to share their experiences with the VNS? Yeah, my name's uh, Dennis. And actually, I just got mine on um, July 2nd, so I'm new to this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm in the process of getting it adjusted. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had fantastic results with mine. The um, uh, amount of seizure activity has decreased, and mm -hmm. so has the intensity of this seizure activity. Wonderful. And um, I was discussing... Soon, the um, turning down some of the uh, medications, mm -hmm. and um, that's what I'm so excited about. And um, you know, maybe yeah, you because know, I'm currently taking four different medications, and um, I take one of the medications. Is, uh, mine's activating right now. Sorry for the for the voice issue here, mm -hmm. but. Um, the Tegretol, I, I kind of joke around about. I take Tegretol times two because of the the amount of Tegretol that I take. And um, but uh, just the the simple fact that um, I um, have had uh, a right temporal lobectomy, and I've uh, went through and. To have uh, the neuropace surgery, and then found out I was not a candidate after going through the surgery process for the neuropace. Oh, and my uh, epileptologist, he had recommended this in the past, and mm -hmm. I just decided that well, I'm getting tired of seizure activity constantly, and mm -hmm. that's what made me decide to go with this. Wonderful. Can I just ask where where did you have the RNA evaluation at? I'm sorry. Where did you, where were you evaluated for RNS at here in Michigan? Um, yeah, I was uh, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Oh, I, okay. I was uh, one of the early candidates for that. Uh, Dr. Ella Savage uh, was the uh, surgeon. Correct. Yep, I know. And um, it just after um, going through the the surgical procedures for it, they found out there was, I have too many focal points, and mm -hmm. they just uh, could not use that device on me. Right, right. Well, it, it is great that it is working for you, and it is working so fast after implantation, so soon. Um, you heard what I said. I said that it typically we see the maximum benefit up to two years after implantation, and you, you've been really responding very well um, if it's already working for you. So um, this is great, and yeah, definitely you'll have good chances of, for coming off of some of your medications or at least reducing the doses. 
Oh, I'm I'm that's the one big thing that I'm so excited about is just mm-hmm. turning down some of the medications and I you know, it's the the cost at the pharmacy every month, um just yeah. taking some of that money and putting it back in our, our our family's pocket every month. That would be nice. Sure, oh yeah, sure. of course, of course. Well congratulations. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful news. And thanks for sharing. <laughs> yes, and and thank you for um you know, taking your time of your day and sharing that with us today. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, does anyone have any questions about VNS? Anyone who's either has one currently or anyone who's considering getting one? Well, this is Marissa, and um, I got to tell in of the uh, non-epileptic seizure. So what is the correlation of the non-epileptic seizure in the VNS? Yeah, so VNS hasn't been studied for non-epileptic seizures, so we really don't have information. Uh, as I already said, it's really indicated for patients who have a solid diagnosis of epilepsy, epileptic seizures, and in particular patients with drug-resistant mm-hmm. epileptic seizures. Um, so I really can tell you um, a lot about um, VNS and non-epileptic seizures, but I just want to mention here uh, something. I uh, personally have one patient who has history of non-epileptic seizures, um, and she has a VNS, and the VNS was not implanted because of her non-epileptic seizures, but because initially she was misdiagnosed with epilepsy. So now, uh, when we already know her exact diagnosis, um, she actually prefers, because we tried to turn off the device and she started having more non-epileptic spells, so she actually prefers to keep the device on um, at low stimulation, so she claims that it really controls her um, spells, and I believe it, that could be the case. Uh, more so, the VNS really improves mood, improves depression, anxiety, and often these are really um, the triggering event, the triggering history that we see in patients with non-epileptic seizures. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, other questions? Yes, my name is Martha. Yes, Go ahead, Martha. And I have epileptic, I have epileptic and non-epileptic seizures. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Well, it, and it, uh, certainly, it, it could if you have epileptic seizures, um, you know, VNS would be would be an an option for you. Um, again, presuming you uh, meet the basic criteria, so. I agree. I need to talk mm-hmm. to my doctor about it. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely you need to talk to your doctor about it, and you need to take into consideration all available options for treatment of epileptic seizures first, and and then if um, the VNS is the uh, most um, optimal uh, option for you, then um, you should probably go with it. But like I said, really it's not going to affect uh, most likely your non-epileptic um, seizures, um, and I only hope that they're quite different from your epileptic seizures, so at least you'll be able to um, to appreciate the, the 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 efficacy of the device. Otherwise, if they they all present the same way, they are uh, quite similar similar in terms of symptoms. It may be very difficult to really know for sure if the VNS is working for for your epileptic seizures. But definitely discuss with your neurologist. Would I continue taking the medicines that I take? Um, if um, yeah, if these are medications for epileptic seizures and you, this is your correct diagnosis, I would say yes. Don't make any changes to your medications before you discuss with your neurologist. If you feel that you need to be seen in a comprehensive epilepsy center, then um, you may just request a referral, and um, we'll be happy to see you. Or there are a few other epilepsy centers in the in the state of Michigan um, uh, with good um, um, epileptologists that I'm sure will be happy to see you as well. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yes, this is Linda, um, and I have a 24 year old son who is diagnosed with. Uh, simple partial uh, seizures at the age of eight. And over the years, he has had good periods of 
being controlled on medications and then would have periods where he was not well controlled, couldn't really identify triggers. He's currently on four medications, Zonagran, Lamictal, Depakote, and Ficompa. Mm -hmm. And currently fairly much so seizure-free if he can remember to take his medications. But the side effects that he has from his medicines, the short-term memory loss, Mm -hmm. um, his forgetfulness, um, things like that. I wonder if he is a good candidate for the VNS, even though he's not having a lot of seizures, he is having, you know, the side effects of the medications, like I stated. He's on four. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a very good point. Thank you for the question. Um, well, um, so I uh, already said in my talk that um, actually one of the indications for VNS implantation would be not necessarily drug-resistant seizures and not that frequent seizures, but it could be just difficulty with medication compliance, adherence, or intolerable side effects, and this is exactly what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, um, he could be evaluated for VNS implantation, but I um, would prefer this to be done um, um, in a comprehensive epilepsy center just because, first of all, um, it has to be uh, really um, uh, figured out why he's having seizures, where they're coming from. It is also quite possible, and I don't know whether this has been done, that he may be a good candidate for brain epilepsy surgery. And I don't want to add... He is not, therapy. actually. He, he was evaluated he was, he, already? He had, a, he had a full workup at Rush University in Chicago last okay. fall. He's mm -hmm. not a surgical candidate. They did the MEG scan. Okay. And did find that his uh, he has a couple. Well, he, it showed only one focus mm -hmm. at that time, but it's believed that he has more than one. But it's very right. deep in the co medial cortex, so okay. that eliminates his ability to have surgery. Okay. Okay. Um, how about RNS? Because and and the reason I'm mentioning about these two options is because VNS is rarely curative. And we know that, you know, brain surgery, okay, he's not a candidate, but it can be curative. RNS also um, potentially can um, cure seizures, although we don't have the long-term data yet. So has he been evaluated for uh, RNS, um, responsive neurostimulation? I think they did all of that, and I don't honestly remember the reason why they said that he would not be a good candidate okay. for it. I think because they felt that there's too many uh, focuses in his brain. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Even, or even if there is, I'm sorry for the interruption, but even if there is only one focus, but it is close to very functional brain area, they cannot and it do is. anything about that. So, yeah, yes. in, in such a case, really, um, given the um, side effects and the number of medications he's been on, I, I think that the evaluation for VNS implantation makes sense. Okay. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, this is Dennis again. Um, if I can, another question. Sure. Um, you mentioned something earlier about um, the magnet being able to help uh, shorten the recovery process of when you have a seizure. Yes. Because um, I never have an aura, so it it. it um, you know, I can't use it to stop, mm -hmm. you know, the progression of one. Mm -hmm. um, is, does, did I hear that correctly, that, you know, when yeah. seizure activity is happening, um, yeah, you can go ahead and use it at that time or yes. to shorten things up? And That's correct, uh, yes. You, you oh, wow, correct. that, that yes. would be... That would be great, would, and if you cannot do it, uh, maybe somebody that's nearby, a caregiver or family member nearby, um, they can do it for you as well. But it, it, it's been shown that the magnet actually really reduces the severity of the seizure, first of all, the duration of the seizure activity, and then, of course, um, this will um, uh, affect the post-seizure uh, period. It, it shortens the recovery. So, yeah, definitely you can use the magnet during seizures. Oh, that would be fantastic if uh, just the recovery afterward, if that was shortened up, that would be nice. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank, yep. thank you. You're very welcome. Could I ask a question of Kathy and, De <coughs> excuse me, Kathy and Dennis? Sure. And that is how are 
how are you feeling with the side effects um, when you have the stimulation occurring every five minutes? What what are your side effects um, to the nerve stimulator? Okay. Actually, um, yeah, this is Dennis. Actually, uh, some of my friends they kind of um, my my voice changes just a little bit, and some of my friends kind of tease me. They say. Oh, sounds like you're going good friends. That is, they notice it, but most people don't. They say, "Oh, it sounds okay. like you're going through puberty again." Um, okay. But so um, you a little bit. I get just a a bit of a um, a just a, a slight tingling or poking uh, sensation in by my uh, uh, Adam's apple, but that's. Uh, Pretty much all that I noticed uh, this last trip to my doctor, I even convinced him instead of taking one step up in my um, change, uh, you know, on the adjustment, to do two steps up because to me it's not much of a uh, any kind of issue at all. And okay. he told me he says that um, I'm. Not not tolerating it the best that he's noticed, but he says I'm one of the best people that's tolerated this device. So other people may not be as tolerating it as as well, but um, I my experience with it, I would recommend it to people. It, it beats um, it beats yeah. having uh, brain surgery. <laughs> My first one that was implanted, I tried it out the very first time. I had it implanted on uh, January of 2003. And um, at first, um, the only problem was was um, when I turned it on, you could feel it on the back of my throat or sometimes, like, now your voice would change. But um, I really uh, liked it, and I felt it helped a lot, too, especially when my son or my sister or somebody said I had a seizure. I told them to just to zap it over me on the machine. And um, also, too, when they you turn it on, you, you can feel it on the inside working. Um, it just depends on, too, how high they turn it up for you. When I first had a battery replaced, um, just August 7th of 2015, um, you couldn't feel anything. My voice would always change, but it's just that um, it was very lightly. It wasn't as heavy a voice change as it uh, used to be, but you get used to it. Um, I always call it a pacemaker because to me it's the size of a pacemaker, but because some people don't know what a Vegas nurse stimulator is, or um, I said it's just about the size of a pacemaker. Um, the... So people would know exactly and point, pinpoint it out. So if I went into a seizure and I showed them where it was, just to swipe the magnet over it, and um, I have felt uh, safe and um, enjoyed it a lot. Like I said, just sometimes when you first get it, uh, the back of your throat, you get that little tingle. Or um, with me, I'm always I can always feel it working. Um, it just depends on the person, but. Like I said, with me, when I first had it, um, I could feel it working, and I, I felt safe with it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I've, yeah, I, I... For, for both of you, I can say, you know what, you can notice the voice change, but it's it's very subtle. If you're not looking for it or paying attention for it, you, it's not something you necessarily notice. So for well, most people, I, I, I voice think voice change it's... is fairly, fairly subtle. I, I think it's something that people have to be aware of, otherwise they don't notice it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I, in my case, I think I have all my seizures are complex seizures, which means that if you don't aren't aware of it, uh, you you lose consciousness or awareness. Mm -hmm. And just the other night, I think I um, was aware of one. And uh, I'm not totally sure, but um, I, I'm, I think I was aware of one. And that's um, since I've had this device implanted. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, three months now. And 
this uh, this device has done a lot for me. It's helped me a lot. So, Wonderful. and I'm I'm looking forward to going here in in a week and a half and getting it turned up again. I'm I'm hoping to get the the two steps again instead of just one. And I don't know if you can notice my voice now. It's happening. And um, I, yeah, you know, if if um, I would, um, you know, I've had three brain surgeries now, and this, um, so it's a total of four surgeries. I would, um, you know, out of the four, this has been the better of the four. So, and it's I've gotten farther along. Uh, you know, the best improvement, this has been it. So okay. I would definitely take a look at this um, if you're considering one of the one of the solutions. So okay. that, that's just my opinion. So That's wonderful. Okay, well, um, we are out Has of time. Has this an FDA approved? What was that? Uh, Has this been FDA approved? Yes, for, for quite yeah. a while now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I do have one question. Yep. Does anybody know if you can use electric toothbrushes if they set off the VNS? Yes, I, I use mine. And you don't feel like it sets again. it off? No, it doesn't doesn't have any problems at all with it. It just says uh, it said that there was. Oh, are we still there? Yep. Yep. Oh, my phone just beeped. Um, it just mentioned that um, electric razor was a problem. But the toothbrush, no problem whatsoever. Because it says in the toothbrush directions that um, uh, elect that it, you have to be careful if you have a pacemaker. So uh, I was wondering about the toothbrush with the VNS. No, nothing yeah. happens. Nothing yeah, happens. I, I, I yeah, the, the toothbrush don't hurt it. Okay. And Dr. Mihalova, have you ever heard of there being a problem with electric toothbrushes? No, I haven't heard from my patients either. Yeah, I okay. think it, it should be okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, thank oh, you so oh. much, Dr. Mihalova, for, for your time and for giving a very thorough uh, overview of the VNS. And, and, um, and thanks, everyone else, for, for sharing your experiences as well. And I hope this was helpful for everyone. It certainly was helpful for me. So, um Thanks again. Thank yes, you. doctor. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. This is Dennis again, by the way. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And thank you. Yes. Thank definitely, you. Uh, you know, give me a lot of help for this uh, for my three months experience here. So, <laughs> have a nice day, everyone. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you.